Uh, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending the launch of the Edelman Global Trust Barometer here in the UK. Now, we are competing this morning with Nicola Sturgeon's evidence giving um, in what is amounting to a pretty as astonishing kind of political drama that's unfolding in Scotland. Um, but I'm grateful for you, that you've all joined to actually hear about what's going on with uh, trust across the four institutions of uh, business, uh, government, media and NGOs. This is the 21st year that Edelman has been studying institutional trust and it's the biggest study in the world. Now, the findings from the first year in a modern global pandemic are pretty fascinating and their implications are very, very important indeed. Look, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ed Williams. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Edelman EMEA. That's uh, corporate jargon for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Uh, I'm going to be joined today by Hugh Taggart, who is our co-CEO of our UK business. He's also our uh, global head of crisis management. Uh, now, I'm absolutely delighted to tell you we've got a stunning panel this morning. Uh, I'm going to introduce them shortly. Um, but before that, I want to set out the key findings and insights from this year's barometer and set the context for the panel discussion. So just firstly, a bit of small print on the study itself. Um, we've studied institutional trust in uh, the four, these four pillars, government, business, media and NGOs, as I say, for 21 years now. It is a very, very rich data set, making up the most in-depth, longitudinal study of trust in the world. Um, we survey over 33,000 respondents in 28 countries, around 1,100 respondents per country. You'll also see that at times we segment the data into two groups, the informed publics and the mass population. Those of you who are regulars will know that the informed public have to meet four criteria. They must be between the ages of 25 and 64, university educated, they must be in the top quartile of income in their country, and they must report significant consumptions of business and political news. The balance is the mass population, so that's everyone minus the informed public. Now, this year in the UK, we conducted supplementary polling in January and February to add further insight, as you can see on this slide. So let's look at the overall trust landscape first. This was a year that continued to see an increase in trust inequality. That's the gap in trust between the more affluent, informed public sample versus the mass population, and something we've seen growing over the last five years. In 2021, we recorded a record 16-point trust gap globally, as well as seeing a record number of countries with double-digit trust inequality. We're seeing two groups living different realities, and that divergent experience, that inequality, is creating major problems. Now, it's almost unheard of for one single issue to dominate the news for a whole year in every country. But in 2020, we all experienced together the greatest global public health crisis in living memory. Its fallout is having huge societal and economic consequences. And you'll see that, that kind of, in some respects, that shift in time. You'll see that how co the COVID crisis moved at pace. We're actually seeing that in the data as well, with the trust picture shifting very, very rapidly over time. In 2020, our mid-year May spring trust barometer update, we saw the pandemic lead to dramatic shifts and a reordering of trust in our four institutions. Trust went up in all. The half-time results for the UK government looked absolutely stunning. We saw surging levels of trust in government last spring, a 24-point increase in four months from January 2020 to May 2020, making government the most trusted institution. But then the wind changed, and over the autumn and the winter, most of those gains were lost. We now see all institutions losing trust giving back most, and in some cases, the media and the NGOs, all of those gains they saw in the spring. And it's government that saw the biggest loss of trust from a quantum perspective, a massive 16-point collapse. This reordering meant that in 2020, business is now the most trusted institution globally, and this is the case in the UK too. As you can see, it's the only institution not in the distrusted red zone, very clear on this slide. 
Now, three years ago, our major trust barometer theme was the battle for truth. We explored the industrialization of misinformation and disinformation, and I'll test you later on the difference between the two. And in the COVID year, we see the, this phenomenon accelerating, and it's clearly contributing to driving down of public confidence. There's no doubt that disinformation and conspiracy theories have undermined confidence more generally. But it's also evident in the data that people think the media has also added to the problem by pushing their reporting to the edges. It seems that many people don't know who to trust, they don't know who to believe, and so don't know what to believe. Many people have lost faith in the traditional markers of information credibility. And so in a fearful, crisis-ridden world, we're facing not just a COVID pandemic, but we're facing an infodemic of epidemic proportions. Now, at this point, I want to hand over to Hugh Taggart, who I think you should on the, see on the screen, kind of actually, no, that way. Um, and he's going to talk to you about how this is all manifesting. Hugh, over to you. Thanks, Ed. I want to start by first looking at trust in different information sources. Alarmingly, not one of the sources of news, traditional media, search engines owned or social media is trusted. Trust in all of them has slumped to record lows. Traditional media is the biggest casualty of the infodemic. Having trumpeted its ascent in 2018 as a flight of quality, the pandemic has proven that there are no sacred cows. Its 13 point drop is the steepest decline we've ever witnessed. The primary reason for their decline is that news organisations are considered biased by most people. Worryingly, majorities believe that journalists and reporters are purposely trying to mislead them and that news organisations are more concerned with supporting an ideology or a political position than they are with informing the people about what is actually happening in the world. It's therefore not surprising that nearly seven in 10 believe that the media is not doing well at being objective and nonpartisan. In this media landscape, it's fascinating that today the most believable source of information, therefore, is employer communications. That is because people are far more likely to trust things that are familiar, tangible and local to them. When asked which kind of communications would be believed when repeated just once or twice, my employer communications scored the highest at 63 percent, higher than government communications or traditional media reports. Employers, therefore, find themselves in a really powerful position to solve problems by providing trustworthy information amidst a raging infodemic. Now, amongst all the challenges that predated COVID and the many that have been deepened by the pandemic, the one thing that has never been clearer is the mandate for business to go beyond their day to day operations and commercial imperatives to meet the needs of broader society. When government is absent or indeed ineffective, people are looking to business to step in and fill the void. 59% believe that CEOs should step in when government does not fix societal problems. Six in 10 also agree that CEOs should take the lead on change rather than waiting for government to impose it. And a similar proportion believe that CEOs should hold themselves accountable to the public, not just a board of directors or shareholders. To put it in a slightly more challenging way, there is huge public expectation on the shoulders of company leaders today. The public want them to weigh in and set the tone on issues beyond business rather than just be silent. A massive 80% say they expect CEOs to speak publicly out on challenges such as the pandemic impact, job automation, societal issues, as well as local community issues. But talk is not enough. In fact, a business must take action before it talks if it is to remain credible. And this is where we see another surprising finding. There is no more urgent task than protecting our planet. Four in 10 people say that COVID has made them more conscious of the impact of climate change. And only 30% think the government is doing enough to tackle it. Just 27% think business is doing enough. So whose responsibility is it to do something about it? Well, the British public see responsibility is shared. Critically, they don't think it just falls to government and business. They believe that they also have a personal responsibility, the ability to act as well as the license to do so. However, here's the rub. There is a gap between the actions believed to have an impact and what the public is prepared to do themselves. There's a worrying and pervasive do as I say, not do as I do mentality. For instance, and you'll see there in the fifth column, 64% of Brits say that using an electric car rather than a petrol car 
would have an impact in addressing climate change. However, only 34% of them would be prepared to or already use an electric car rather than a petrol car. That's a massive 30 point gap. Now you might put this down to high perceived costs and concerns about convenience, but this wouldn't explain the 27 point gap that we see when it comes to people jetting off for a vacation. Of the 14 individual actions to reduce climate impact that we explored in our study, 13 see a double digit gulf between what people thought would make a difference and what they would actually be prepared to do or already do. The one action that sees a single digit gap was around reducing plastic waste. This is in no small part a consequence of the Attenborough effect, driving environmental awareness and action on plastics. It suggests considerable opportunity for public education and empowerment campaigns that build movements to positively impact climate change. And in the year of hosting the G7 and COP26, business and government in the UK in particular has a major opportunity to show leadership. It is a critical area for building trust with the public. The greatest opportunity for business to gain trust is by performing well as a guardian of information quality, ensuring that only reliable, trustworthy information is being shared and consumed. But other key trust building actions show that people are looking for business to act for the long term. While delivering a robust response to COVID and driving economic prosperity is important, respondents were emphatic. The long term sustainability of our environment was a critical responsibility of business and a key means of establishing trust amongst its stakeholders. But business importantly cannot go it alone. It must partner with other institutions to address societal challenges and be alive to the destabilizing forces that we are seeing emerging. And to talk about just that, I'm gonna hand it back to Ed. Ed. Thank you. Thanks very much. So when it comes to those destabilizing issues, the fracturing and potential breakup of the country has to be pretty high up there. Our study this year suggests just that, that the integrity of the United Kingdom as a single entity may now be under threat, though one might safely say the same about the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon this morning. We'll see how the day passes. But look, what we see in the data is this perceived mishandling of the pandemic in Westminster, driving widespread concern about the future of the union itself. COVID has exposed government strengths and weaknesses more than any other event we've experienced in our lifetime. You really wouldn't envy being the government. They've been under the microscope every day for a year now. Lockdown at home, the public judged the UK's performance, UK government's performance relative to other countries, New Zealand, kind of Singapore, Germany, as well as relative to the devolved nations within the UK. Just one in four people across, across the UK as a whole say the UK government has performed well in its handling of COVID, compared to nearly six in 10 people who say it has performed badly, poorly. It is precisely because we fought I'd argue much of the public health crisis at this devolved nations level rather than a national level that we're seeing this big national difference in how people judge the handling of the crisis. Our study shows that the Scottish and Welsh governments are seen as outperforming the UK government by those living in those countries. Similarly, the leaders of the devolved governments in Scotland and Wales both enjoy considerably higher levels of trust amongst their populations than Boris Johnson. Now, quick caveat, this was last month's data. But at that point, Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's first minister, was enjoying the trust of 62% of those in Scotland. It's a stunning number. And Mark Drakeford, the Welsh first minister, was enjoying the trust of 43% of people there. It's clear in the study this year that the UK government's management of the pandemic appears to have tipped sentiment towards the breakup of the union, particularly in Scotland. 45% there in Scotland say the way the UK government has handled the pandemic has made them more favourable towards independence compared to 29% who say it's made them more favourable towards remaining in the UK, while 20% say it's not impacted their opinion one way or another. Opinions in Wales and Northern Ireland are more evenly divided, but significant proportions, around a third of the populations in both nations, say the way the UK government has handled the pandemic has made them more favourable towards in independence. Far from bringing the United Kingdom together, the COVID-19 crisis has helped unearth and create divisions. 65% of the British public say the pandemic has made them realise how divided the countries that make up the UK are. 61% say there is a decreasing feeling of national unity 
and 59% say it's made the breakup of the UK more lightly. I mean, these are pretty depressing numbers. You know, and that last number is a number that jumps 11 percentage points to 70% amongst those living in Scotland. Now, our findings reveal that this issue doesn't just lay at the door of government. People also feel dissatisfied with how they are represented in the UK national media. Um, in Scotland, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, a majority of the public believe the UK wide media does a poor job of representing all the nations and the regions. Perhaps unsurprisingly, in England, only a minority thinks so. Similarly, most people outside England would also like to see more representation in the UK media of all the nations and regions that make up the UK. Despite all the fractures and grievances exposed in the study, when asked whether they would vote for the country to leave the union, this is, we're talking about Scotland here, if there was a referendum today, people in Scotland are split, 44 and 41 against. Very similar findings to the poll some of you may have seen in the Mail on Sunday last week. And with elections uh, to the Holyrood Parliament um, just months away and increasing talk about, you know, new independence referendum, um, a significant proportion of the public remain undecided on this issue, with nearly 20 percent of those in Scotland unsure about how they might vote. And that suggests hearts and minds are there to be won um, during an independence uh, referendum or, you know, indeed more generally, you know, put it another way, you know, minds are there to be persuaded for the case for the union. In Wales and Northern Ireland, the case for independence appears far weaker, but there are Grow, there is, you know, we see in the data growing discontent. So as we move through the denouement of this crisis, the UK government, I'd argue, faces three definitional tests. Test one, how it builds back trust and confidence as the unlocking takes place, particularly in the devolved nations. Point two, how it delivers against its agenda to build back better and level up across the nations and regions. And point three, how successful it can be in making the case and benefits for the United Kingdom and for the nations part of that story, how we communicate the emotional case, not just the economic and rational one. And I think it is significant and it is interesting that we are seeing, we haven't seen the UK government get credit for two things. One, a mammoth, mammoth fiscal stimulus plan, um, you know, 271 billion of uh, borrowing and uh, 11 million people on furlough costing over 50 billion. Plus, you know, the success we've had in the vaccine, both um, uh, uh, procurement, development, procurement and, and rollout. That doesn't seem to be playing through the numbers yet. But look, answering all of these questions will play a major part in determining whether the division set out today can be repaired or represent growing fault lines that will expand over time. And for those looking to keep the UK together, building trust across all the nations and regions as the, uh, of the country as, it, and as the country emerges from the pandemic is obviously an urgent and critical task. Um, and it's not just for government, but as Hugh said, it's for business has a role and, and, and it would seem the media do. So unprecedented times and an unprecedented set of trust barometer results. And to discuss this year's findings and other topics, we've got, uh, as I said, an extraordinary panel this morning covering business, media and politics. First, Alex Mann. Alex became chief executive of Channel 4 in autumn 2017 and is the first female CEO of a major broadcaster. The business is funded by around one billion annually of advertising revenue and has a unique purpose to innovate, take creative risks and inspire positive change. And critically for our discussion today, ensure that all of Great Britain is represented in its programming. She's had a formidable career in the creative industries, in technology. Um, and if that wasn't enough, she's also a PhD physicist from Imperial for Good Measure. Um, Andrew Neil is chairman of the soon to be launched television channel GB News, which has generated controversy without even airing a single minute. Andrew has a astonishing media career that spans print and television editor of the Sunday Times for over a decade, founding chairman of Sky TV, uh, and for a quarter of a century, you know, I remember him when I was there at the BBC, one of the most feared political inquisitors during any general election, and I'm relieved today that I shall be asking the questions. Um, Baroness Nikki Morgan was Conservative MP for almost a decade and has a distinguished parliamentary career. 
She was Secretary of State for Education, Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. She chaired the powerful and influential Treasury Select Committee and held ministerial positions within the Treasury itself in David Cameron's government. So she, I've no doubt, will not be short of views on the government's levelling up and building back better agenda as the government leads the country out of the pandemic. So I'm so grateful that we have all three of them today. For those of you watching uh, at home, um, do ask questions. There should be a little sort of panel underneath this um, stream. So put your questions in there and they will come to me, but I'm gonna have a go first. I want to start really by these two big topics, government trust and the future of the union. Andrew, can I come to you first? Um, I described this drop in trust in government from May last year to kind of January, February. It's a calamitous drop. Um, Why did it go so wrong? Well, I would say a couple of things. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't overdo the collapse in trust, actually. Uh, I mean, the government's currently six to eight points ahead in the polls at the moment, which at this stage in the political cycle is quite remarkable. I mean, the opposition should be ahead by at least 10 points. So I think you can overdo the trust thing. It's also your own study showed uh, there was a four-point rise in trust again towards uh, the government uh, as the vaccine rollout program began. And perception is always behind reality in these matters, public perception. I think if you continue to poll in March and April, you would find that that 44% rising again. And you saw that perception behind reality in the way into the pandemic. Yeah. It took, uh, you know, it started with very high levels of trust. I mean, after all, who else were you going to trust but the government as we face this unknown uh, uh, sort of sort of threat to, to us? Uh, and it took a while for the public to realise that on a number of fronts, the government seemed to be making a complete horlicks of it. Uh, and then you saw the, the collapse uh, of, of trust. Uh, collapse may be too strong a word, but certainly a serious decline. Problems over PPE, constant change, confusion in, in policy. You're coming out of lockdown. No, you're not coming out of lockdown. Uh, and so on. And, the, and it became apparent, I think, to a lot of people that uh, this was a pretty B or C division cabinet. The Tory gene pool was seriously depleted. And a lot of ministers just weren't up to it, uh, including the prime minister. Uh, this was a prime minister for the good times, not the bad times. And so I think you add all that together and the trust quite rightly began to fall. It's not a unique phenomenon in Britain, the same has happened even worse in France, uh, not the same in Germany, but even more so in Italy. So you can see uh, th that. And I think now you're beginning to see a return uh, of some trust in the government, but it'll all be down to performance. And I think it's, it's easier to lose trust than it is to gain trust. So yeah. the government, even if it's the Labour Party that has a bit of a leadership crisis on its hands, I mean, if we were speaking four or five months ago, I would have told you, the Tories will have a leadership crisis by spring. Yeah. I mean, the, vac the vaccine has turned out to be the government's economic policy, the government's pandemic policy, and Boris Johnson's recuperation policy all put into one. Uh, so uh, no question trust is, has, has fallen. But uh, the final thing I would say on this Ed, is, although I think the government, the public were quite right to lose trust in the government's handling of things, I lost trust uh, in them. As, as, as the pandemic gripped and we went into the summer, then in, into the autumn, it seemed to lose grip, didn't seem to know where it was. And the public inquiry will be pretty horrendous when it comes to, to look at these things. Mm -hmm. My sense of the politics is that the public will more likely judge the government by how it comes out of the pandemic yeah. rather than how it went into the pandemic for all the mistakes that were made. And if it does, as it seems to be at the moment, do a pretty decent job in coming out of the pandemic, that politically will matter more than the mess it made of a number of things going into the pandemic. So, so um, Nicky Morgan, do you think, as Andrew was saying, all things will be forgiven? I mean, I absolutely agree with him that I don't, I don't I suspect... didn't say all things will be forgiven. Okay, some things, things will be yeah. forgiven as the success of the vaccine is um, uh, uh, is felt. And I do agree with you, Andrew, by the way, that I don't think many governments kind of benefit for, in a sort of favourability poll when it comes to a pandemic. But Nikki, what do you think it's been like in government managing a crisis like this? How difficult has it been, do you think, on the inside? Oh, I think it's been phenomenally difficult. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine 
what my colleagues have, have gone through. I mean, um, government is not renowned for being terribly nimble. Um, and um, although there are wise sages who say uh, that they could see this uh, crisis coming and heading in our direction from, from China and from, from Italy, I mean, you know, the truth is that when I did my handover notes to Oliver Dowden, who succeeded me as DCMS secretary, you know, dealing with the uh, fallout for the culture, arts and sports sector from a global pandemic was not on my to-do list for him uh, or suggested to-do list. Um, but within weeks, the government had to pivot to obviously dealing uh, with this. Um, and I think Andrew is right, which is that uh, people remember how we got out of this. Um, uh, of course, what, what we see in, in the um, uh, evidence from the pandemic is that many people's views will be completely shaped by their own personal experience. Yeah. The job they were doing, uh, the sector they were working in, uh, whether sadly they've lost a, a loved one, um, you know, all of that uh, will obviously uh, go to shape people's uh, responses at the next election. We've got obviously got the local elections, um, uh, you know, some a big set of elections actually coming up in May, and that'll be the first test for both the government and for the opposition. But I mean, I think ministers will have also found it really difficult. 2020 was meant to be the year you know, Brexit had, had happened. There was obviously a trade agreement to be negotiated. Uh, but the government wanted to get on with levelling up the global Britain agenda. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson was uh, going to be able to, uh, to, to to go around the world. Uh, we would have a majority in Parliament. Um, and obviously, suddenly all of that is ripped up and ministers don't get to do any of the things they wanted to do. Uh, and, and they have to deal with the uh, with the fallout. Of course, not just ministers, it's officials too. Uh, the civil service had to completely pivot um, and change the way it was doing things. The Treasury completely against their normal expectations, obviously having to put in place things like the furlough scheme very quickly. And, and, you know, and there were, I'm not going to say there weren't some issues. Of course there were. But the furlough scheme, um, uh, we will obviously hear more about today. But if by the end of September we've managed to keep millions of people in work through that, it will have been absolutely the right thing to have done. And universal credit, uh, again, has actually been something that I think if you'd, I know you had Amber on this panel last year, yeah. I suspect as the former DWP secretary, if you'd asked her, that would have been one of the worries um, would have been, you know, is the universal credit system going to hold up? Um, and by and large, it absolutely uh, has. I think ministers will be completely um, conditioned by this as an experience. And um, those who, who stay around the cabinet table um, after an expected reshuffle, you know, will have been, uh, will, well, that experience will be very important in the way they run their departments going forward. Can I just slightly change tax and talk about the kind of media's reporting of the crisis? Alex, I mean, you saw the numbers that we presented that six in 10 people believe the government has performed poorly in its handling of COVID. That is despite, as Nikki says, the the, the huge, huge econo economic stimulus and also Andrew pointing out the very, you know, the successful vaccine program as well. Do you think the media has had any responsibility in terms of painting a sense of kind of, Cha cha you know, kind of chaotic kind of disorganisation with, within government? What's the role of the media in this? Well, I guess the role of the media is to report on what's actually going on. Yeah. So if there has been a sense of chaos. I'm not sure you can put that down to the media. Um, but I would say that, look, our job is to question and to challenge and uncover. And when times are tough, that can be particularly hard on politicians. Um, but as everyone said, this is not a crisis that anyone ever trained for, is it? So it's not surprising there's been a degree of chaos. And as Andrew said, I think we're coming through it a lot stronger now. The vaccine rollout is spectacular, and that is what people are going to remember. Um, but what we did was focus on two things. One was trust and information and bringing knowledge to people about how to look after yourself, how to avoid getting it, you know, that definitively saved lives because mm. that's the information that people want. I mean, trust in public service broadcasters went up. It dropped in radio, it dropped in newspapers, it dropped massively in social media. And we'll come on, I'm sure, to talk about disinformation and misinformation and your points about information hygiene. Um, but it went up in public service broadcasters because people know that they are regulated and they are there to provide facts. And the other thing we did a lot of was entertainment and distraction. Because mm. let's face it, we've all been completely bored, <laughs> trapped at home, um, cooking endlessly for our loved ones, um, who've been turning into our hated ones. 
And that people wanted that. People wanted what's the distraction? How are we in this together? What can we do but stay at home on the sofa and watch television? And they turned to us in droves for that. So there's a sort of dual role there. Facts and information came first, for sure. And that's what people wanted in their droves. You'll see that news ratings went off the charts for the public service broadcasters. So th this um, point you make, um, Alex, about in it together, um, it seems then we see that in the data that that's not quite how people felt from a from a you know political standpoint. This this issue about the future of the union has come through very clearly in the data uh, this year. It may well have already, and I suspect was already apparent, but it seems that you know the COVID handling has kind of scraped it off to to reveal it a bit. Nikki, how how serious do you think the government is treating? The, the threat to the union and how easy do you think it will be to bake the kind of union story, if you like, into all government departments? So I think the government is obviously treating it very seriously. I mean, uh, you know, we are the Conservative and Unionist Party um, and that bit is taken uh, very seriously. Um, I think, as you know, there's been obviously um, the usual sort of focus on personalities in number 10, who's dealing with the union, the setting up of this uh, union uh, committee. Um, but I think what that will do, exactly as you say, Ed, is instill, the intention is to instill a discipline within Whitehall um, that uh, things should be seen through a union prism. Uh, those departments that uh, operate um, in areas of policy that aren't devolved should make full use. And I think the UK, the internal market bill that we were debating at the end of 2020 should be seen as a bit of a marker, really, which is about the government and Whitehall being more assertive in terms of the areas of policy. And they will remind people, I think particularly in, in Scotland, but those areas, things like the vaccination rollout, where the UK army is offering support, and that's uh, that's happening, as well as obviously the SNP record. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated to hear what Andrew's going to say about the events uh, this morning up in Scotland, because uh, I think a lot will obviously uh, hinge on, on that. Um, the uh, the leader of the Conservatives up there, Douglas Ross, has said that uh, Nicola Sturgeon should be resigning. Um, and clearly um, the government will will be waiting to see what happens in terms of that uh, particular fallout uh, before obviously being able to uh, to decide uh, exactly how they're going to to take on the further calls for a referendum, which I'm sure I'm sure will come. Um, and I think your point in the presentation about the fact that throughout the pandemic, what the public has seen, of course, is the four nations um, responding to the pandemic, making different decisions about lockdown dates and when to come out. And I think probably if people who never really thought about the union, um, then actually that has really crystallised in their minds. Actually, there is a difference between the four yeah. nations and, uh, and what you know, Boris Johnson working out, Michael Gove, how we how we get that initiative back. So, so, Andrew, I want to come to the question about Scotland and the SNP and uh, Nicola Sturgeon's future in a second. But, but, but first, do you do you think the nation's leaders have an easy ride compared to the UK government? Yes, uh, I mean, in terms of the government, the UK government, it certainly is concerned about the union, but it doesn't yet know what to do about it. Uh, in its most honest moments, they would admit that Boris Johnson in saving the union is a liability, not an asset. Uh, and I certainly know that one Tory strategy is, for goodness sake, whatever we do, don't have a referendum as long as he's prime minister. Uh, <laughs> let's wait. So I think there is a problem there, but they are beginning to get their act together. I think the, the Edelman Trust uh, barometer is absolutely right. The pandemic has played a major role in uh, kind of... Uh, aggravating the differences within the United Kingdom. And it's one of the uh, unintended and unforeseen consequences of devolution. Here you have a pandemic hitting the country, uh, probably the most serious threat to the country since the end of the Second World War. And it never crossed anybody's minds, probably not even Nicola Sturgeon's at one stage, that we were gonna deal with this existential national threat as four separate nations. Uh, that, that in effect for the pandemic, Boris Johnson would be the Prime Minister for England and that Nicola Sturgeon would be entirely in charge of just about everything north of the border. And of course, she has played that for all it's worth. She has been perceived to be more successful at dealing with it, partly because she's more articulate than the Prime Minister in dealing with it, also because she does have a supine uh, local media there that very rarely ask the hard questions. But I think that has exacerbated it. And I think looking back, people will be quite surprised that 
as the country faces this threat, we did it in four different ways. Now, in reality, in the end, if you look at our response, there isn't actually that much difference between, let's say, Scotland, England, or Wales. Northern Ireland, a little bit uh, different with its land border. But, you know, the, the, the Johnson government had a, a care home uh, scandal at the start. The Sturgeon government had a scare, uh, care home scandal uh, as well. Uh, the Dominic Cummings eye test ride to Barney Castle, uh, which played out in the media for a long while. Uh, the, Nicola Sturgeon had her chief medical advisor going several times to her holiday home too. It didn't play as big in the Scottish media. But I think this is quite hard to put back in the, the, the box. But I do think it was a mistake. I, it's partly because we slept walked into devolution and it's so asymmetric. It was basically to Scotland, Wales as a catch-up, Northern Ireland be its own story, devolution in England is mainly limited to a couple of big uh, cities here. Um, and it's exacerbated by having people, well, someone in Scotland, who doesn't just want to do things differently, but wants to break the union. I mean, it's not, so you've got a situation in effect uh, in American terms where you, you, you have the federal government running all of Texas in a pandemic response, but the governor of California running California entirely on his own. And yeah. at the same time wanting independence from California so it can join Mexico again uh, or, or, or whatever. And I think that's been a big mistake. I think that the, the media, uh, there's been two problems the media have uh, been to Nicola Sturgeon's advantage. One is that she does not get nearly as hard a time uh, um, from the Scottish media, broadcasters and print as Boris Johnson rightly gets from the London-based media. And the second problem has been that when the London-based media turn to Scotland to tackle it, they just don't have the factual base to be able to do so. You've seen that time and again uh, when the very fact Scottish politicians know more. So I think they, they, it means that they can't really pin them down in the, the way they would a cabinet minister in London. So I think this has all exacerbated the change. However, it is a moving picture. Uh, and I come back to the vaccine rollout. It is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And proud as I am of and a product of one of the ancient universities of Scotland, uh, last time I looked, Oxford is not in Scotland. Um, and I think, the, the, uh, the, which is maybe why the SNP constantly referred to as the AstraZeneca a vaccine, <laughs> Oxford quietly uh, gets gets done. So I think that does help. And don't forget, it was the official SNP position that we should have stayed in the European regulatory uh, framework and that we should have been part of the Europe-wide uh, um, procurement of the vaccine. Well, how does that look now? I mean, I think the vaccine rollout has strangely uh, reminded people of the benefit overall of the union. Uh, plus, of course, and the Tories are very bad to get that message across. The furlough scheme could only have been financed by a government with the borrowing powers of the United Kingdom. And I just one final thing on this, because I mean, this, this is a government of slow learners, uh, particularly when it comes to Scotland. Uh, and they've been their own worst enemies because they've realized now that as they pump a lot more money into Scotland and under the Barnett formula, they get a ton more money. At the moment, it's all being pumped through the Scottish government. So what then, what happens? First of all, the Scottish government takes all the credit for that extra money. And at the same time says, he is mayor, he is mayor. We want more, we want more. It's not enough, it's never enough. And so it suddenly dawned on the, the London government that one way to get the value of the union across is that maybe the London government should start spending in its own right in Scotland helping to rebuild city centres, help to uh, deal with the, the worst uh, drug problem in Europe in the east end of Glasgow. And, and you remember when we were in the European Union, you travelled around uh, the country, you see lots of this project brought to you by the European Union, and you would see the stars and the blue flag and all the rest of it. I wouldn't be surprised if that's a way the government goes to try and get uh, a better recognition that it's not all just the Scottish government. The one final thing, I would say, of what I would call the British Armed Forces, but what the SNP simply call the Armed Forces, they have also played a major part in this vaccine rollout and in dealing with it. And the British Armed Forces 
are one part that most of Scotland realises is a huge asset to the union. Uh, Andrew, thank you. I feel with, 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 with that answer, we're getting a small glimpse into what GB News might be like. And, um, you know, you're, that good it's, nice, it, it's nice to see you off the leash now. Um, uh, can I um, can I come to you, Alex? I mean, obviously, broadcasters, Andrew was at one, the BBC, for a quarter of a century. You run one at Channel 4, uh, broadcasting into people's homes every every day. Uh, um, what role do broadcasters have, and particularly public service broadcasters, in making the case for the union? How are you thinking about this? What's the what's the part that Channel Four can play? Look, I don't think it's surprising that we feel the union is more under threat and more under discussion than it's ever been when we have this decreasing feeling of being together and none of us can remember what the rules are here, let alone what they are in Scotland or if we're allowed to go across the border to Wales or not. You know, it's not surprising that that's a, a dreadful shock. And to Andrew's point, clearly um, the leaders in the nations have had a much bigger chance to speak and take that platform. Um, far be it from me to comment on how they've done it. I think the reality is that we have to make sure that we're reporting properly. You know, we have in Scotland, Kieran Jenkins, who reports there. We have in Wales, Andy Davis. We had Krishnan up in Edinburgh at the moment reporting on the Sturgeon case. You know, we're doing that coverage. We've got Darshna reporting in from places like Leicester, talking about what's really happening there on the ground. But we have a lot more of that to do. And the truth is, the broadcasters all called wrong the Brexit referendum. They were at the time too focused on what their mates in London thought. And there has been a need for change there for a long, long time. Now, as you know, we've made huge strides to try and change our organisation. We've already got a couple hundred people in Leeds. We've located the biggest department we've got in terms of spend out of Glasgow now. We've got an office up and running in Bristol. Mm -hmm. We're moving to spending 50% of our money outside of London. But it's only by doing that that things will change. Like you've got to have programmes made by people who don't live in the metropolis or the biggest metropolis. You've got to have editorial conversations that are always including significant figures who don't live in London. And we've got that now. And people say... Well, it's all very well, that programme, but no one outside of London will watch it. Thanks very much. And it's that that starts to change opinion. But it takes a long time to do that. And we have got to change our organisations away from a belief that things happen better in London or bigger things that happen in London. And that only happens by having a lot of your people and senior people based elsewhere and often coming from elsewhere. And there's another important piece of that. We're going to move the news to be co-anchored out of Leeds multiple nights a week later on this year. That will be the first time that a national broadcaster is doing that. That starts to make a difference because it makes a difference on screen in terms of what people see. And the other big difference is for young people coming into the industry. You know, for the last 20 years, if you were coming from Newcastle or Edinburgh, you know, you had no chance of getting into this industry because there was no local industry. So for us, that's a lot about bringing young people in elsewhere and having the work that goes with it. So it also means that we've got to shift the network of companies that make things to make sure that there are sustainable small and medium businesses in the creative industries outside of London. So it's multiple years to do it. Mm -hmm. But if we don't do that, the audience is really unhappy because they don't see themselves represented on screen. And then they turn off and watch something else. So it's to our advantage to do it, but it takes a significant amount of time to do it. I think that's our responsibility, is how we do that and how we change the opinions of the people we have so that we change what's on screen. So I want to leave at least 10 minutes of questions that we that I've got coming in here. So just to really four or five minutes at, at most on the next topic. And um, Maybe a question to you, Nikki. Alex operates under a very, very strict licensing regime in the UK, broadcast licensing regime. As you know, I mean, you used to run the DCMS. I mean, there are, you, you raised this issue already, you know, there's a significant impact we're seeing around uh, media polarisation, around um, conspiracy theories, disinformation and misinformation. What's your view on the kind of regulatory question about content on the web and the platforms? We, you know, we saw President Trump kicked off Twitter really right at the 11th hour of his time as president. Um, what do you think should be done about kind of regulating content on, on the Internet? 
Well, I think we need to get on with it. Uh, I think we are um, late to the party, not just here in the UK, but I think around the world. They've got these enormous uh, global uh, tech uh, companies um, who have, I think, finally very belatedly woken up to the fact that they are publishers um, and they do have um, a, a responsibility uh, for the content that they put out, exactly as you say, which is that um, you know both Alex and then and Andrew and GB News get go, Andrew, gets going. Yeah will have to follow the um, Ofcom rules on broadcasting. Um, and yet we have these uh, platforms uh, that are being looked at by millions of, of people uh, spreading um, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, dubious um, uh, information, sometimes downright deliberately fake, um, obviously, um, uh, sadly, providing echo chambers um, and uh, and rather opportunities for abuse of, of, well, all sorts of people, as I say, people in public life, but it's not just, it's just a general uh, boiling everything down uh, to, what is it, 280 uh, characters now. And it's not all bad. I mean, no, absolutely, there are, there are times when these um, organisations offer, in terms of of um, oppressive regimes, people the opportunity to speak out. Um, and of course, there are a number of businesses, for example, that would not have even survived the last year if they hadn't had the ability to go online to be able to offer their services in that way. Um, but I think that jurisdictions now, they'll be chasing online content, they'll be chasing all the sort of data hoovering up. And as we've seen with the Australians, and I think that that battle will spread around the world, this issue about uh, the publication of other people's news content on platforms and how that is paid for, the issues around digital advertising, the impact, particularly on smaller uh, media outlets. Um, governments need to uh, to embrace this. When I was DCMS secretary, I published the next stage in our online harms response. Um, Oliver Dowden then published uh, the final uh, response in December, shaping what's going to be, I think, oh, the second half of this year, Parliament will be, we'll see what else goes on, but I think it'll be a big debate about the, the regulation of, of online harms. Um, and it's not a moment too soon. Do you think, Andrew, do you think the government has the confidence, if you like, to take on this argument in a meaningful way around kind of regulating content online? I think in principle it has, but it's also out of its depth and doesn't know that much about it. I mean, one of the problems of the regulation is always that it, it's, uh, it's always way behind reality. Yes. Uh, and that's true of, of all regulation, not just on media. I mean, if you, you go way back to the uh, 1880s and 1890s in America, when the what became called the robber barons were developing monopolies in uh, steel, Carnegie, oil, Rockefeller, uh, the railways, J.P. Morgan and all the rest of it. And it it was a while before the politicians got their act together. First of all, President McKinley at the turn of the centre and then uh, Teddy Roosevelt after that. And they brought in the trust busters and the antitrust pro-competition uh, stuff. Now, I would argue that Facebook and, uh, and uh, Google and the, the like are far more powerful in our society than Rockefeller or Carnegie ever was. So I think it is difficult. I think politicians are always behind the curve on this. They are kind of, in general, analog people in a digital world. Uh, and our politics are still quite analog too. And they need to catch up. My only fear is that, and, and I agree with everything Nikki said, I think these platforms, they are publishers and they yeah. should be held to account for what they publish. And it's just a question of getting the right regulations in place to, to, to do that. Once you've done that though, it's not the end of the story because at the moment, you get the regulations in place, then the the what's happening on the ground is changed, and you need to keep moving the regulatory structure uh, uh, along. You look at a lot of the financial regulation that was brought in after the great crash of 2008; it's now largely irrelevant for the financial problems that we face. But it does uh, have to be done. I think regulation is something in Britain we're rather good at. Ofcom has created a, a rather benign. I don't think it is that strict. But it's a rather benign regulatory environment, provided you know the rules and don't, you know, yeah. take the mickey uh, out of them or, or behave egregiously, as some of the foreign channels based in Britain have done, and they have been rightly slapped down as a consequence. So I remember, Andrew, you'll remember this from your time at the BBC. There was often a sense that the BBC was kind of doing a good job of impartiality if as many people on the right were complaining as people on the left. And I sort of never really bought that, um, to be honest. But um, the, the, the question about kind of the operating and licensing regime, actually, and GB News is coming up quite a lot in, I'm just seeing now, in the questions that are coming through, um, uh, which is, uh, 
uh, potentially, I think, good news for you in terms of the level of interest here. I mean, there were a few questions f from you, um, uh, for you. I mean, uh, people are asking how frustrated you are about being pigeonholed as the kind of Fox UK. Is that something that is um, annoying you? Is that irritating in advance? And another question here for you around um, how you pl plan to gain and retain the trust of your new viewers in the context of um, what's described as woke culture. Any thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, look, it's good publicity, and I suppose all publicity is good publicity. Uh, we're, we're a couple of months away from launching yet, but it's good that people are talking about us. Uh, it was more than the case when I launched Sky Television all these years ago. <laughs> Almost nobody talked about us at all, and I think about five people came to our launch party that didn't actually work for me at the time. Uh, and I don't think we'll have that problem this time. But it is frustrating, too, when people smear something uh, that hasn't even broadcast. And, uh, I, and, you know, if you look at my track record as a journalist, I will have nothing to do with disinformation, nothing to do with conspiracy theories, nothing to do with fake news. Anybody who follows my Twitter line will see that from the moment I came off air, having anchored the BBC's live election coverage uh, in November, the presidential election, I never at any stage gave any credence to the idea that Mr. Trump had won the election, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that in fact in every case he lost, 50 court cases, uh, his own party in Georgia admitting he'd lost two. So I don't want to go down that road. And by the way, I would say to our investors, uh, just look at what that's led to, a multi-billion dollar lawsuit against Fox News uh, for going down these absurd uh, conspiracy theory roads. Uh, and they will lose, they have no defense. They've attacked a machine company, a voting machine company uh, that actually only had one voting machine in the election in that well-known swing county of Los Angeles, where, of course, obviously you have to fix the votes in favor of the Democrats for them to have any chance of winning. So I don't want to go down that road at all. My proposition is broadly that the existing broadcasters come from a largely the same ideological space, a center, center-left view of the world, some more left than others. It's a metropolitan collectivist view of the world. That's fine. I think at their best, they are still, when the big stories come, they report impartially. But the selection of stories, the attitudes they often take, mm -hmm. uh, are, are come from a, a general agreement. I'm not sure, uh, outlook in the world. It's not just me saying it. Mark Thompson said it when he was director general of the BBC. Alex today has virtually sort of said the, the, the same thing. Andrew Marr has said that it is. And I don't think it just comes, you don't change the outlook of a broadcaster by moving a chunk of it from London to the West End of Glasgow, for example, or to the posh parts of the fashionable parts of Leeds or Manchester. They've got the exact same views as London. I mean, you take the West End of Glasgow, it voted, I think, four to one for Remain and even voted for proportional representation. The West End of Glasgow and Cambridge were the only two areas that actually voted for PR in the whole country. So geographically doesn't change. It's a question of voice. Are you giving voice to people that feel they don't have a voice? One of the things I was struck with, and for a while it gave a new lease of life to question time, which is when it went to the north and you had audiences in Yorkshire or Lancashire and some Southern smoothie would, on the panel would say, yes, but of course they didn't really know what they were talking about, did they? And all you had were these Lancashire or Yorkshire accents and, oh, yes, we did, you patronizing <laughs> twit. And I think we want to give a little bit more voice to that. I think that if we just come from a slightly different center, center right view of the world, there is a ton of space between that view of the world and Fox News. Sure. Uh, a ton of space. We don't have to go anywhere near that. I think there's no market, I'm glad to say, for a Fox News in Britain. And there's nothing in my career as a journalist that could lead anybody to think that I would want to have anything. So, Andrew, we've got, thank you. we've got five minutes left. I think I should at least ask Alex to come <laughs> in if she wants to respond to any of that before I ask another question. I enjoy being virtually paraphrased by Andrew. But um, what I would say... Uh, is we have changed. And you heard me say that. I can't say what Mark Thompson said, but he was in these jobs a while ago. But what I would say is good about DB News is the point is it will be regulated by Ofcom. And mm -hmm. Andrew 
that regulation. They're a tough regulator. You know, the post broadcast regulator, but that's what they do. We've got a very clean bill of health on impartiality with them. But what I would say is good about all the TV channels and the news is this debate is held in public. So if you agree or don't agree with what's on GB News, you will receive the same output, whoever tunes in. And the issue with social media is yeah. that's not what you get. You get a bubble, a partisan, a feed that comes to you based on what you've already seen and what you've already liked. And what happens is that the points from the left or the right get further and further and further apart as you are in your bubble and you click on more of the same. And that's the problem. The discourse is not public. And there's nowhere that that's worse than the threat to young people. Because it's not just that discourse isn't public, so they're not learning those skills, they're not learning the skills of debate, they're not seeing the range of opinions. There is also extremely dangerous content out there when we go to harm, when we go to anti-Semitic content, when we go to racist views, things that none of us would ever even think about publishing, let alone get away with. And they're not regulated. Mm -hmm. And there is nowhere that danger is bigger than to young people whose rates of self-esteem are plummeting and all of which is in line with social media. You know, we can't keep people off their phones. I love my phone. I love the internet. But what is happening now in terms of the content that young people particularly are seeing is incredibly dangerous to society. And that's why we need regulation. You know, we're all in favour of that. Whether GB News or Channel 4 News have got different points of view, great. You know, that's good to have that out in the open air and people can make their choice. And there's plenty of room in the market for that. And we'll both be regulated. We are both going to be regulated by Ofcom. And I can give this pledge today that channel that GB News will be nowhere near as much to the right as Channel 4 News is to the left. So, <laughs> job done. <laughs> Completely <laughs> impartial, as you know, Andrew. <laughs> 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 and in fact, Channel 4's impartiality in the eyes of consumers has risen over the past three years, is at record levels, much higher than the BBC or ITV. But let's see what happens with GB News. Right, Indeed. last last question. I'm going to go to Nikki, Alex, and then I'm going to give the last word to Andrew because he'll know to finish on time. Um, so um, <laughs> Hugh was talking about attitudes to climate change. And we've seen yeah. in the study that, that the public are saying now this is a bigger priority issue than COVID, yet they are pretty pessimistic about our ability to do anything about it. We've got the G7, we've got COP in Glasgow. Um, the message for business and a message for government around building public trust around climate, what can be done? Um, Nikki, I want to come to you to ask that question, then Alex, and then we'll end with Andrew around top past 10. So, Nikki, what can be done to build public trust around climate? Well, I think there has to be um, a very clear sense of a plan, both from government, which I think we will hear, as you say, around the G7, particularly around COP26. This is a personal priority for the Prime Minister. It's not just something he's been uh, told he should be interested in. He really does uh, care about it. Um, and so I think that means that um, uh, direction from the top really makes a difference in Whitehall um, and, uh, and it will filter uh, through. I thought what was interesting about your slide was, of course, tackling climate change is not just about what uh, government can do. It's about what all of us can do. And I think the, the trouble is that it still feels completely overwhelming for, for most people. Um, you know, we, we perhaps got used to recycling. We're a bit better about what we do with plastic waste. Um, I think there'll be more incentives around electric vehicles, but it's still rather uh, overwhelming. What we've seen in the last year is that in the in the face of something completely unprecedented and enormous, we have to change our behaviours when we are told to do so. So I think clear guidance. The final thing I'd just say to business, and it's a real shame we haven't got onto actually all the business statistics that you had in your trust barometer, because I think uh, that the role of business is fascinating. All I'd say is that when government bandwidth is as constrained as it currently is, businesses shouldn't wait to be asked um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to take on a priority like climate change. The more, and many businesses are already doing this, the more they can do, the more they can make it clear to government and others, including employees and shareholders, what it is that they are doing. That will then be picked up. Um, and I think in this case, imitation is a sincerest form of flattery. Those schemes can then be uh, you know, uh, copied uh, or taken on by others uh, and, and expanded. But I do think this is absolutely an area where business and employers have a real role to play. Alex, you're running a business. What's, what's your answer to this question around what role you can play in building trust around climate change? And then to Andrew, and we'll close out. I mean, I think your point is fascinating that people have got greater trust in businesses. And I wonder if there's a piece there where during all of this pandemic, they've been able to see their leaders, mm -hmm. check if they fit 
fit and do their promises, speak to their CEOs, you know, in a way that has been stronger than at any time before. Mm -hmm. And I think when we go to climate change, the onus is on that to do it, us to do it as well in our businesses. What are our carbon neutral goals? How are we going to fix sustainability inside our own organizations? But for us as a broadcaster, that's also how do we make that interesting? How do we make it fun? Right? How do we make this sound less like homework? Because it's actually an issue that people really care about. It's the biggest issue that young people care about, partly because they haven't had to worry about pensions yet. Um, but how do we make it easy for people to do? So for us, there'll be a whole run up of programming that's a bit more lighthearted and instructive in a good way about how do we make this easy for ourselves? What changes can we make personally, individually as businesses that make a big difference? And I'd agree with Nikki's point is there is an onus on us as business leaders and as broadcasters to do that. Mm. Andrew, um, your message to business around what they can do around building public confidence and trust that we're going to tackle climate change, and then we'll we'll end. Well, the well, we're actually at uh, ten thirty now. So how long have I got? Because I'm. Go on, give, us a minute, give us a minute. Give us a minute. A minute. I mean, when it comes to climate change, the British media is pretty much a one-party state. So if there are difficulties in convincing the British public of what needs to be done, then. I don't know how you can do that if everybody's saying uh, the same thing. What I would say is that you need to start being honest. We know that there's a number of things we have to do if we're to cut CO2 emissions. We've not been honest, either the media or the politicians, about the costs that will come with that. Every gas cooker will have to go. All gas central heating will have to go. Uh, there will, will have to be a huge increase in other forms of power if we're to go electric car. Uh, pumping cars with electricity during the night will no longer be downtime. It's going to become expensive uh, mm. again. Mm. We don't quite know what to do when the wind doesn't blow. What will the backup be? That will be expensive too. We want to even in the end get away from natural gas. Well, what will that be if we're going to get away from nuclear too? And we know we've made a complete mess of nuclear. It's the most expensive nuclear power station in the history of mankind. So I think a bit of honesty is needed. Otherwise, that trust level that your, your barometer talks about mm will fall even further because people will start with goodwill towards climate change and then say, if they're not told the truth, you never told us about that. Uh, why didn't you tell us about that? I didn't realize that. So I think bringing the public along with us is a very important thing. On the final thing I would just say on business, do not get carried away by the fact that business seems to be a bit more popular now uh, than it was. Uh, the moment business starts to get involved in political and public issues is when it becomes unpopular. The moment a chief executive thinks they should be doing more than running their company and taking public positions is when they need to come in front of people like me. By and large, they hate doing that, and they're not very good at it either. Uh, and they don't like being held to account because they're CEOs. They're used to just telling people to do something, and everybody does it. So I would be very careful. The thing that I would have most hope in is the ESG. I mean, ESG investment was 17 trillion new dollars in America last year. And that forms certain behavior, in the environmental, the social, and governance. I would, con I would ask business to concentrate in running their companies that is uh, along the lines of ESG, because that's what they should be doing. And at the same time, that is where the money is going. Mm -hmm. So that's not a bad way of doing things. Do something that is good for society and your business and will get you investment at the same time. Don't take the signing calls of how trusted you are. I think that is a great way to end. And that is the advice we would give all of our clients. So, um, Andrew, <laughs> thank you very much. Nikki, Alex. I mean, what a great session. I feel we could have gone on a lot longer. And I know the people who are watching would have liked us to, but we've all got things to do. Um, but for now, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for joining this. Um, I think you'll be able to watch this on repeat in perpetuity. So anyway, enjoy that. But for now, thanks very much. See you thank later. You. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. -bye.